Well, hello to my uh, colleagues from Canada. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at your center director's meeting. And uh, I'm going to be talking about emicizumab. Now, rather than review the Haven 1 through 4 trials and safety and efficacy data that I'm sure you're all very familiar with at this point, I would rather have a discussion about how we use emicizumab in children. I call it a journey through the ages. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't have uh, the ability to get into specific adult issues, but happy to discuss those in the Q&A session. These are my disclosures. Of course, I have disclosures from Genentech and Roche, the manufacturers of emicizumab. So let's start with the patient journey. Ages zero to three, basically pups, uh, and their major issue is intracranial hemorrhage and inhibitor risk. Ages three to 12, I call those the PTP young patients, not my last name young, but because they're young. And in this uh, age group, the main issues are activity and trauma. 13 to 18 is the PTP teens, and the major issues here are high-risk activities and adherence. And then there's the adults, and again, I won't really have time to discuss that. So we'll start with the journey uh, backwards, and again, I'm happy to discuss adults uh, in the Q&A session if there are questions about that. So let's start with the teens, 13 to 18, and I mentioned already the major issues, high-risk activity and adherence. So what are the other general issues in teenagers? They have increased independence. They're assuming responsibility for their own care. They uh, often participate in high-risk activities and sports. And of course, the biggest issue for them is adherence. Now, there is minimal to no data on emicizumab in high-risk activities or elite athletes. Emicizumab does convert patients to a mild hemophilia phenotype. And so for such patients, the decision to prescribe factor VIII prophylaxis versus emicizumab should be carefully considered. Uh, for example, a high-level ice hockey player, uh, assuming you let them play that in Canada or other such activities, um, if this person infuses factor prior to every practice or game, uh, such that they have peak factor levels in the normal range, emicizumab may not be the best option for them. So I think you have to think about that when you're thinking about teenagers and uh, what are they getting out of factor VIII prophylaxis versus what they can get from emicizumab prophylaxis, the pros and cons. For high-risk activities, there's the adding, or the British like to call it topping up, uh, with factor VIII for activities. Now, this may make sense if it is not a frequent activity. So a skier uh, who goes skiing a few weekends a year and wants to give a couple extra doses of factor VIII while they're up on the mountain, far from a medical center with a risk of getting injured. However, it doesn't make sense for the patient who is in activities multiple times per week. I've had parents ask me, can I put my child on factor VIII three times a week with their activities while they're on emicizumab. It doesn't make sense financially, obviously, but frankly, it also doesn't make sense biologically because factor VIII and emicizumab compete with each other for the substrates. And um, when you get to a level of above about 20% uh, that the uh, factor VIII is, uh, the emicizumab, I should say, is no longer having much of an effect. So what about adherence? So here's a couple of papers on adherence. They're a little bit old, but they do illustrate the points very well. So this is looking at the uh, likelihood of adherence uh, according to age groups. You can see here's the 12 to 23 month old patients and the two to five year old patients where you see adherence is quite high. Uh, nearly 80% of the patients are getting uh, more than 80% of their doses. As we get to the school age kids, it drops off a little bit. And then in the teenagers, it really drops off a lot. And I think uh, this is something that we're all familiar with within our own clinics, uh, even if we can't necessarily uh, quantify it in the same way as you can in this study. The major reason for lack of adherence turns out to be lack of venous access. And I think we all understand uh, that venous access is uh, really problematic, not just that it's difficult, but it takes time and it's painful. And so if we can overcome the lack of venous access with a drug that, for example, is subcutaneous as emicizumab is, that may help with adherence. But do we have any data on that? Well, just a little bit. A year ago at the ISTH meeting, there was this abstract from Tyler Buckner with the group in Colorado looking at improved prophylaxis after switching to emicizumab. So let's take a look at the one slide we have from this uh, paper. So if you look at the left side here, we have adherent is above 80% proportion of days covered with treatment and non-adherent is less than 80%. So here's factor therapy. And you can see there's a lot of patients that are falling below the 80% threshold of uh, adherence. So in other words, non-adherent. You see many patients there are non-adherent. Then some of these patients, or these patients, I say, were switched to emicizumab, 
So the non-adherent patients here moved to this level of adherence. So you can see that overall adherence improved quite significantly. In fact, it improved really in all the patients except for you see one patient that did drop a little bit, although we were still in the adherent range. So this is the only data so far about improved adherence with emicizumab. I certainly look forward to seeing more data, and I assume other people are looking at this uh, carefully. Let's look at a quick case about breakthrough bleeding. 14-year-old male with severe hemophilia and inhibitors. So he's been on emicizumab. He's now playing uh, football on a club team. He's become more active, and he injured his ankle during a game, and he has significant pain. And then there's a 16-year-old male without uh, inhibitors, also has been on emicizumab, and he got injured while skateboarding and twisted his knee. So how do we manage this? Well, obviously, it depends on the presence of an inhibitor or not. So what do we know about breakthrough bleed management from the clinical trials? So you're familiar from the safety data from Haven 1 that there were five very serious thrombotic events and thrombotic microangiopathy. So total five of these events. And when the data was analyzed, we learned, and I know you all know this pretty well, that this was associated with the use of APCC for treating breakthrough bleeding. You can see the 13 bleeding events that were treated with more than 100 units per kilo for 24 hours of APCC for more than 24 hours. Five of the, uh, all five of the uh, thrombotic events and TMAs occurred uh, at this uh, dosing regimen of APCC. And you can see that if you did treat that way, that you were at about a 40% likelihood of ending up with a thrombotic event or a TMA. With factor 7a, there's this nice publication collaboration between Genentech and um, uh, Nova Nordisk. And this is kind of a complicated slide. Let me just walk you through it quickly. This is the number of bleeds, uh, bleeding episodes treated. This is the number of doses you see is color coded and the total dose is on the uh, X axis. Let's just focus on any time rather than these other uh, cutoff times, which is related to when the mitigation strategy started. And let me just point out here, here you see about 30 bleeding episodes treated at around 90 micrograms per kilogram with basically one dose in the light blue. Here you see about 60 bleeding episodes treated at more than 270 micrograms per kilogram per dose. And you can see that's greater than six doses in the dark blue. So you have a huge range of dosing from one small dose to multiple large doses. And the bottom line was there were no thrombotic events or TMA with factor 7a, regardless of the dose and number of doses given. So this is where the black box warning comes from. I'm sure you have a similar one in Canada, which is warning against or uh, letting you know about the caution to be used between APCC use in breakthrough bleeding uh, when patients are on emicizumab. What about uh, non-inhibitor patients? So here's the data from the HAVEN-3 trial. See there are about 215 or exactly 215 total events treated, lots of different doses of factor eight uh, and lots of different durations. And the bottom line is there were no thrombotic events. And this makes sense because again, factor eight and emicizumab compete with each other. So there's no additive effect. So you shouldn't worry about treating a breakthrough bleed in a non-inhibitor patient with whatever amount of factor eight you feel is uh, appropriate and necessary for that bleed. You will not run into trouble with thrombotic events. So, to summarize, in breakthrough bleed management, in inhibitor patients, avoid APCC if possible, rely on factor 7a, and use the lowest doses and fewest doses of factor 7a necessary. If factor 7a fails to stop the bleed, you can consider admitting the patient to the hospital for APCC with monitoring. For non-inhibitor patients, I say manage the patient the same as you did before. Whether they're on factor 8 prophylaxis or factor 8 on demand, you just manage the bleeding events the same. We put together a little algorithm with this group uh, you can see here, names you're familiar with. Um, and uh, I won't uh, walk you through this in detail. Suffice it to say that it's basically the same thing I said earlier, using factor 7a, minimizing the doses that can be used at home, getting some consultation if the bleed doesn't stop. And if factor 7a isn't working, we do suggest admitting the patient to the hospital for APCC so you can monitor them for TMA and for thrombotic events. Okay, let's get to the uh, ch uh, children who are three to 12, the school-aged children. I mentioned activity and trauma are their major issues. So what are some of the other differences with school-aged children? Many of them have central venous catheters, and of course there are consequences to that. This is the first time kids are away from their parents, and they're very prone to trauma with school activities, playground, playing with friends, things like that. Now for parents, the important thing is the convenience and ease of infusion. 
particularly families that have multiple children with hemophilia. So based on all this above, what would you choose? Would you choose a factor VIII concentrate, standard half-life, or extended half-life, or emesizumab? And of course, it's a case-by-case -case decision for patients. So I have this algorithm where green is the standard approach, yellow is a new approach to be used with caution, and red is the limitations. So let's take a look at a PTP. Factor eight, let's assume they're on factor eight prophylaxis with a standard half-life factor eight. Now I know in Canada, you've probably converted most of your patients to EHLs with your tender, but for the sake of this discussion, let's just say somebody's on a standard half-life factor eight. If they're responding well and they're adherent, there's no reason not to continue that therapy. That would probably be the standard approach. However, uh, that means IV access is needed. There can be vein fatigue. Some patients have central lines. It's certainly inconvenient. And we already discussed the adherence issue, which is, tip is, is more typical in teenagers, but can occur at any age. If they're not responding well, you can switch them to an EHL factory concentrate, but it still has a lot of those same issues uh, as the standard half-life, because again, you're going to be dosing IV and usually at least twice a week. So another option, which I believe is a standard approach now, is to start emesizumab. What are the uh, limitations here is we don't have long-term data on joint protection. You're not replacing what is actually missing in the body. And there are some questions about bone health. And all this will need to be answered in time. Of course, you could continue the current therapy and try to be more aggressive or improve support for adherence. But often, that doesn't really work. Um, and so for the patients on uh, EHLs or for the patients that you kept on an SHL, there's always the option, uh, if you don't do it right away, to switch them to emesizumab. So that's my uh, PTP algorithm uh, for uh, this age group. So a case, we have a nine-year-old with severe hemophilia diagnosed at nine months of age. Um, and his first joint bleed was at one year of age. Very typical. He started prophylaxis. He had a port placed. But over the years, he had numerous port occlusions treated with TPA locks. At the age of eight years, we couldn't use his port anymore. It was removed. He rarely had joint bleeds. But now, because we couldn't use the port, we taught the family venipuncture. But the venipuncture became very challenging over time. He started missing doses of factor, and he actually started to have bleeds more frequently. We tried an extended half-life factor eight, but that didn't really help. The dad sent me this picture. It's actually the patient with bandages, band-aids. You see six of them here. And uh, he told me that that was for one infusion. And uh, obviously, we don't want our kids to get uh, uh, go through that kind of process. So in October 2018, emesizumab was licensed in the US for patients without inhibitors. And he was started on it then, and he's had no bleeding events. And uh, the parents are easily able to administer the subcutaneous dosing, and they're very happy with the switch. Briefly about surgery, this is an eight-year-old with severe hemophilia with no inhibitors. He had some dental caries. He needed a tooth extraction, and he'd been on emesizumab for about six months at this point. So we counseled the family about the option to use prophylactic factor eight or just to rely on the emesizumab. So you know, what would you do? What does the data suggest? So together, we decided to manage the dental extraction with no prophylactic factor. We did prescribe them amino caproic acid. So here's the data from uh, the HAVEN trials. You see there are lots of surgeries, mostly minor. And we're going to focus on uh, some of the minor surgeries, specifically dental procedures. So these are the minor procedures managed without prophylactic coagulation factor. So they did not get any factor before their procedure. And you see 91% of these procedures across all these different ones did not have any postoperative bleeds. There are 42 dental procedures. Nine resulted in a treated postop bleed, so that's 21%. What about the other? What about managed patients who are managed with prophylactic coagulation factors before their procedure? Again, you see about 90% did not have postop bleeds, but notice it's not different than in those that didn't get prophylactic coagulation factor. And for the dental procedures, of which there were 22 in this group, Five ended up with post-op treated bleeds, 23%, so pretty much exactly the same. So it doesn't seem like it makes a difference whether you get factor before the procedure or not. There is always going to be some risk for bleeding after the procedure, particularly with the dental procedures. So that's what happened with our friend here. Dad sent me this picture 24 hours after the procedure. So initially, there was no bleeding, but then there was this oozing. We gave one dose of factor eight. Uh, he had a nice clot there, and then it completely resolved. Uh, uh, right there. So there was no harm in this patient by not giving prophylactic factor eight. Uh, he got one dose afterwards and he did well and clotted. So I want to close with a discussion about PUPS, where the major issues are intracranial hemorrhage and inhibitor risk. Let me start by saying there are no published PUP 
uh, studies of emesizumab. There's a few case reports here and there, and there was one prospective patient on the HOHO EMI study, but obviously we can't take much from one patient. So mostly what I'm going to offer is my opinion. The pups, of course, keep coming, so we have to treat them. Uh, even in the absence of data, we're going to have to make some decisions. Uh, there are PUP studies underway. I listed three of them. I know that uh, Dr. Carpeo is participating in the Haven 7 trial, and uh, perhaps uh, you guys will participate in some of the other trials as well, or some of your other centers may be in Haven 7 too. So why use emesizumab in PUPs at all? So let me start with a case again. An eight-day-old male with no family history undergoes a circumcision. He starts bleeding and continues bleeding for several days in spite of conservative interventions, ultimately got admitted to the hospital. His hemoglobin was 4.7. He got transfusions, and we diagnosed him with hemophilia A. So five weeks later, he's fully recovered. His parents are very educated, spent a lot of hours on the internet and social media. And in fact, they met one of my family, uh, one of my other patients' families uh, on social media. And that child had an intracranial hemorrhage at three months of age. So during our discussion, at a, as a five-week-old, they say, Dr. Young, please do everything you possibly can to prevent an intracranial hemorrhage in our son. What should I do? So after an extensive discussion, I agreed to start him on emesizumab. But of course, I told them that there's no data on the use at this age. This is, by the way, two years ago. Uh, I'm not sure how effective it'll be. I cannot promise that we won't have an intracranial hemorrhage. And we discussed the issue of delayed inhibitor development. So let's get into emesizumab in pups. So you can start prophylaxis early, and maybe it can prevent intracranial hemorrhage. And we're going to talk about that issue now in some detail. Obviously, this is a devastating complication, or can be devastating when it does occur, and it typically occurs early in life. Uh, this UK cohort study illustrates that very nicely. You see here uh, ages on the y-axis and the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage on the x-axis. And you can see that by nine months of age, most of the patients who are going to have an intracranial hemorrhage will have one, and it comes up to about 6% of the patients with hemophilia A. And I'm going to use this in the nine-month cutoff when I show you another algorithm shortly. So with IV factor, it's really impossible to prevent intracranial hemorrhage. It's not possible to start prophylaxis in the first few weeks of life. If it was, we probably would be doing it already. But with emesizumab, at least it is possible to do intracranial hemorrhages. So maybe we can make an attempt to prevent intracranial hemorrhage if it's desired. In fact, the National Hemophilia Foundation uh, MASAC group even has a comment in their emesizumab uh, recommendation that says, in addition, infants should be considered for prophylaxis with emesizumab at any time after birth, given the increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage prior to initiation of factory prophylaxis. So can emesizumab prevent intracranial hemorrhage? Well, there's no proof, and it'll be impossible to prove with a study, I'm quite sure. It likely does improve the coagulation profile, even in neonates. And so for now, I think emesizumab can be considered for this purpose um, in parents who are particularly concerned about this complication and who are willing to start subcutaneous injections at a very young age. My youngest patient without an intracranial hemorrhage started emesizumab at two weeks of age. Now let's talk about this other issue, a typical time of inhibitor formation, which can be very delayed and may occur at a dangerous time, such as after a trauma or during surgery. So inhibitors, uh, here's another paper from the PedNet group, and Manuel is a co-author on this one, looking at the timing of inhibitor development. And we see that the vast majority of inhibitors develop by 20 exposure days, and nearly all of them by 50 exposure days, and just a few lagging out to 75 exposure days. So how do we manage delayed inhibitor risk? So here's that economic impact model looking at delayed inhibitor development in patients on emesizumab. Um, and Essentially, I made this figure from the data that they presented on this model, that if you assume prophylaxis starts at nine months, with factor VIII prophylaxis by four months of age, patients, uh, sorry, by four months of treatment, patients will have developed their inhibitor if they're going to have an inhibitor. But with emesizumab prophylaxis, because of the infrequent use of factor VIII, only for bleeds, surgeries, and things like that, the estimate is that the mean would be 13 and a half years of a risk period and this is to 20 exposure days. So typically, it would take four months to 20 exposure days with factor. They'll take 13 and a half years on average with emesizumab. So this is what I mean by delayed inhibitor development. So how did my patients handle this? Well, one of two ways. One family was a, had a very high concern for this inhibitors, and we didn't want to live with that uncertainty. And so they chose to start factor VIII prophylaxis to reach 50 exposure days 
at which point we know that the risk for inhibitors basically goes to almost zero. They reached 44 exposure days in five months, and uh, it was very difficult to access the veins any further. He didn't have an inhibitor, and that patient was switched to emicizumab, and he now has almost a zero risk for lifelong inhibitors. On the other hand, I had another patient, they weren't all that concerned about it. They really didn't want to start um, factor eight. They didn't want to poke their child's vein, so they chose to go on emicizumab prophylaxis. He's now three years old. He's had zero factor eight exposures, so he clearly has an ongoing risk for factor eight inhibitors. So something to keep in mind as you try to manage these pups with these different options. So I'll close with another algorithm. Again, the same conventions of green, yellow, and red. So if you have a new pup who's less than nine months of age, and there's a strong desire or need to start prophylaxis, such as if they have an intracranial hemorrhage or they're at risk for it and the family's really concerned about it, you could start emicizumab, but I put that in yellow uh, because uh, that is certainly something that's new. And the main limitation here is what happens with this delayed or maybe even increased risk for inhibitor development. What you could do when they get to be greater than nine months of age is to add factor eight for tolerance induction or inhibitor unmasking, I prefer to call it, where you can add a factor eight concentrate at you know, one of several different intervals, but then um, the weekly or every two week interval where you may not need a central venous catheter may not be sufficient to prevent inhibitors. And the full dose regimen will require significant IV access, usually with uh, IV catheters. For the patient who's older than nine months, so they're not less than nine months, the standard approach would be to start prophylaxis with a factor concentrate, but we already reviewed the issues of IV access. Once they reach 50 exposure days, they're no longer a pup. They could continue on factor eight, or they could start emicizumab. But the other option is at nine months of age, you may not want to start emicizumab right away in a pup at two weeks or three weeks or five weeks of age, but you could start them at nine months of age with emicizumab. And then we have that same issue of delayed increased, delayed or increased inhibitor development. And again, there's that option for adding factor eight at some point as well. And that's my full pup algorithm. And if you like these algorithms, I used them at an ISTH talk last year. Uh, they are now published, uh, just very recently got published in the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis uh, with this paper. So with that, I'll stop, show you a picture I took of the Adirondack Mountains that I visited uh, last year. I spent a lot of time in sleepaway camps there and the Adirondack Mountains, you may consider it to be South Canada. So of course I was there close to Canada. So thank you and I'm going to stop here.